Elena, thank you so much for joining us, albeit sort of digitally, the way we're all used to, uh, to chatting to one another now. Um, it's really great to have you joining us over at Hedge. You are starting what seems to be a really fascinating research project, Denmark and Russia, why two Arctic empires develop so differently and continue to diverge. It would be really great just to sort of kick things off if you could tell us a little bit about how you became interested in, in these sort of these countries, this historical development, and what the motivation behind the project is. Uh, thank you for all your kind words, and I'm also happy uh, join to us do and I agree with you maybe uh, it's not um, it, 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 it's a little bit um, uh, not very polite from my side to say it but I'm also uh, love the project and I really think that it could tell us something um, and um, I don't remember I was trying to remember one Oh, me and my future uh, supervisor Paul Sharp from Professor from SDU, uh, when we decided that we can do this project. And my impression that just once at the conference, I heard from him that there was serfdom in Denmark. Uh, and um, you can imagine uh, that Russian historians in general, not very interested in the Danish history. So I was surprised. Mm -hmm. um, and that surprise uh, started, um, the search. Um, so we um, the problem with Russia and in general with historians, because originally I'm a historian, I'm trained as a historian, that we are very deeply rooted in national narratives. Mm. So we get accustomed uh, to think about our countries uh, as unique, uh, as uh, countries, as something that impossible to compare with something. Especially, and Russia is a special case because it's too big. And at the first place, it seems like it's just impossible to compare it with anything. Uh, of course, Russian historians are trying to do it right now. They're trying to compare Russian Empire with Spanish Empire, with Ottoman Empire. But what I think is really cool about comparison with Denmark is that we have a lot of uh, in common. And it's not that obvious. Um, I will tell about it slightly later, like maybe not bum bum bum, but still uh, I, I will try to organize my thoughts. Uh, but in general, we were thinking that um, Russian and then uh, Russian Empire and Danish Empire, uh, they have they uh, have one thing, very important thing in common, they were agricultural empires. Mm -hmm. We get accustomed to think about industry as a main driver of economy, but we have some examples when agriculture uh, became a driver of the economy, uh, or at least it, um, it was accounted for a big, um, for a big amount of uh, GDP or economy in general. Uh, so, and uh, it was surprising how for example, in the 18th century, Russia and Denmark were so similar in any possible terms, uh, but starting from the beginning of the 19th century, they started to diverge. And eventually at the end of the 19th century, at some point, Denmark became like a teacher in agriculture for Russia. Hmm. So it's, it, again, it's uh, a little bit difficult to believe, uh, but still that's true. Uh, and we have a very nice example about butter. Uh, very taste example. Uh, so in general, the idea was that, okay, we have two peripheral, with all due respect to every possible people from any possible country, these uh, empires in the 18th century were peripheral uh, and they were very similar, but then something happened. And as you told, uh, they started to diverge. Uh, to diverge. Fascinating. It's, uh, it's something that I'm really looking forward to sort of following the development of this, uh, this project whilst you're at SDU. I think what would probably be, be really helpful for me and I imagine also for the people watching this video is if you could just sort of set the, the, the time frame that we're, that we're looking at these two, these two nations, these two, two empires in, mm -hmm. and then also set the scene a little bit. So what was sort of 
what were the borders of these nations or these empires and how they differed from today? What were the economic and social and sort of cultural drivers at the time? Uh, thank you. That's actually a very important question. And partly it is very difficult to me to answer because I'm a historian and I really want to tell about every possible detail of history. So I will try to uh, point out just the most important things. So first of all, we are talking starting from the, belief, uh, from the beginning of the 18th century. Why? From the Russian perspective, from Russian perspective, it has some sense uh, because Peter the Great came into power and there was nothing uh, war, um, so it makes sense. I mean, historically, it makes sense because Russia changed a lot. Uh, in uh, in Danish case, we could start slightly earlier, but not uh, that much from 1660. And I'm pretty sure that uh, I don't need to explain uh, why. Uh, so then we are talking. Then we like this is our starting point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from that moment of life, these two empires, they became, they became um, allies much earlier, but like the whole history of, the, of two empires, it was kind of focused um, on Sweden because Sweden was a common threat for both, uh, for both empires and they were trying to replicate uh, Swedish experience in any possible terms, uh, in terms of economic, uh, in, economic in economic terms, in terms of taxation, um, social structure, uh, and so on. So like two empires were developing, looking at, uh, at Sweden and trying not to allow Sweden to control them or just like to stop Sweden and not uh, to allow uh, it to expand. Uh, during the 18th century, there were a couple of very important um, moments uh, and very like surprisingly that uh, the second half of the 18th century in both countries um, went uh, under the light of enlightenment. So it was a very important uh, movement in both countries and it started simultaneously and very, very, I mean, like even in terms of personalities, it was very close. Uh, and I really believe that um, enlightenment is really bad for countries uh, because uh, enlightenment uh, emperors, they want to organize the country in a proper way. But the problem is that Russia was a really very big empire. You can't control every possible uh, place of the country. Uh, and also don't forget that at that moment, Denmark was also a big uh, country. So it has, uh, it wasn't why I'm uh, telling that this country is an empire because it has even, it, it had even uh, its colonies. Uh, and um, I understand that in terms of geography, it's difficult to compare to countries, but still let's imagine. Actually, I have um, even a picture, maybe I can demonstrate it if you will allow me. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I will show you one thing. Mm. So this one, mm. can you see it? Yes, we can. Yes, greatly. So you can see, yes. Uh, so this is Denmark and I pointed out the places where actually were colonies uh, and you see that you can't see, but um, you can imagine that there was agricultural uh, core. Uh, there were uh, territories that were more developed in terms of industry, and they were vast of territories without any uh, like proper use. The same thing in Russia, actually. If you see, uh, um, I, I pointed out that the ratio of plow land to the total land uh, was 16%. So when we are talking, uh, so the same situation, of course, in terms of like size, um, it, it's very different, but mm. in terms of ratio, it's very close. So we, Russian, um, um, Russians had to exploit a very small part of the territory to produce a lot of agricultural product. The same happened in Denmark. Uh, and this, in the 18th century, both empires were absolute monarchies. 
uh, and um, it's also important because absolute monarchs could um, provide their ideas only through elite and mm -hmm. the question is how what they could give elite back like uh, because elite could um, serve, of course, but they should have something back. Uh, and I really think that serfdom explains a lot uh, because um, serfdom was not just um, a backward institution or whatever you can tell, it was a fiscal institution. It means that serfdom was the only possible way for both countries to collect taxes. Who else could be on the places to provide rule decisions and to collect money and physically transport it to the center. Only nobles who had their rights at that moment, but also serfdom is still not good for the economy. It could be worse or better. We don't know it. My main point, and actually I think that I hope this project will um, pointed out that we don't know anything about serfdom. So we just should think about it as un something unknown and it could help us um, to start asking normal questions about what's going on. But uh, serfdom could not, um, produ uh, could not produce a lot uh, of super um, surplus products. It mm. means that inequality uh, elite inequality in both countries could not be high. And actually, that's why, for example, the Russian Empire could survive for such a long time, to my mind, because uh, if we compare, for example, the uh, living standards of peasants and, ser and serfs and living peasants and living standards of nobles, of course, the discrepancy is great. But if we compare living standards among uh, nobles, it wasn't that big difference. And uh, this um, ground for Russian absolute monarchy was very, uh, was very solid. And to my mind, the same, more or less the same was in Denmark. Uh, so it means that this solid uh, noble estate could be a very um, good clue for the whole empire, why this empire exists in the first place. Um, so, then one thing happened in Denmark and unfortunately didn't happen in Russia uh, at the end of the 18th, in 1800s, uh, serfdom was abolished in Denmark. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you might know, in Russia, it happened only in 1861. What's the problem? And actually partly this project started because uh, I started looking through uh, Russian periodics uh, in 1850s when I saw uh, contemporary researchers and um, journalists who were telling, look at the Denmark, they managed to sort out problems that we can't manage, uh, that we had to manage now in Russia. So Den uh, Denmark was considered by Russians of that time as an example of something uh, progressive. Uh, and what we what we are trying to do, uh, we are try we we will try uh, to estimate the level of inequality and what was actually living standards. And I can provide uh, you some clues. For example, uh, it's from our paper with Paul Sharp that was accepted uh, in Journal of Russian Economics or in the Russian Journal of something. Uh, it was accepted in very good journal. Uh, and uh, you see that, of course, data for uh, Denmark is much better and mm -hmm. Hedge working, it was working greatly. Uh, in Russia, we are just studying the same things, but you can see that actually uh, in the 18th century, the situation in Moscow was slightly better than in Copenhagen. Mm. Uh, so you see, what we can what we can see even the numbers that okay so Copenhagen was doing slightly worse than Moscow then we more or less the same at the end of the century of course there are not enough observations but it's only the beginning of the project but what happened at the end of the 19th century Russia started doing much worse than Denmark mm. that's so we we see even the numbers that there was something the most like I really believe that it's very, it's it's too easy to explain all these differences just by abolition of serfdom. Mm. I believe in serfdom and that serfdom matters. 
But what I think we should try, we should try to understand serfdom better and to not just to, to state, okay, it happened because of serfdom, but to explain the mechanism, how it happened exactly. Because serfdom, it's nobles, serfs, markets, all these things, how all these configuration um, of uh, all these elements was, uh, was working in Denmark and Russia. And I think in this case, we can understand better serfdom in general. Mm, yeah. So, <laughs> sorry. That's, that's, um, I think that I think there's a lot to respond to there. I think that's a really comprehensive and fascinating sort of summary of the of the of the similarities. So you've sort of preempted my question in that regard, and I think I would also certainly agree that it that there's always something more complicated going on, right? And 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 it and it helps one's methodological approach to bear this in mind and to. And to and to consider this and the, the the mechanisms and the interactions and I guess almost the political economy of what was going on at the time, and I suppose a, a, a question it prompts me to ask actually is whether you're in a whether you're in a position already to begin to sort of share some of your emergent findings more broadly about both the the the, the question of knowledge transfer and you've touched on it just now but also comparative inequality. Or is this something we can look forward to over the coming weeks and months and years? Um, well, your questions contain a lot of things. I will try to tell you the most, to my mind now, interesting uh, uh, point. Uh, and I want to show you one more picture. And I really think that this picture is uh, fascinating. I'm trying um, to... Um, so, can you see the picture? Yes. Yeah, so, and the question is, of course, what is this? Uh, that is actually the advertisement of Siberian butter. So what happened? I just kind of wanted to start from the from the end. Uh, what happened uh, in the beginning in the and the end of the nineteenth century, the beginning of the uh, the beginning of the twentieth century, uh, Danes started to open butter creameries in Siberia, and they were happy with it. And um, uh, Danish uh, cons Danes consider considered uh, Siberia as a new um, America for um, for Russian industry for Danish industry in general. So you can see like a very typical Russian pictures and Russian images, but actually it's the advertisement of a very famous uh, Danish factory, Randrup factory in Omsk. So you can see how like Danish names. Uh, were um, uh, matched with uh, typically Russian pictures. And uh, looking at this picture, I want to tell you more about, uh, about knowledge transfer. So mm -hmm. what happened actually, um, Danes helped um, Russians to start the whole industry, butter industry. Of course, Russians were uh, producing butter before, but it was not butter that we are using now. It was a very different type of butter. So what happened, uh, a couple, um, a, Dane couple, a Danish couple uh, was invited uh, in, in Russia. They started creamer in Vologda and started producing uh, butter and they opened uh, a school where they were teaching Russians uh, how to produce butter. And starting from this very small school, the whole butter production uh, happened in Russian uh, empire. And by the end of the, uh, so in something like in 1880s, uh, the export of butter was almost zero, but by uh, 1900s, the export production, uh, the butter production in, in Russian budget was up to 100 million rubles. Well, Could you imagine? Yes, exactly. It was fastest growing industry. And it happened thanks to, uh, to Danes. Of course, in Russia, we have another narrative. We have a narrative when we actually don't, uh, we almost don't notice uh, the role of Danes, but it was like Russian noble who started doing it. Actually, that's not true. I mean, um, 
uh, of course, maybe it, it's kind, it could be like a pitch in Russian uh, pride, but it's not. It's just like what we can see from the collaboration of two industries uh, and using the comparative advantages of two industries, that's the most important thing. Because when we are talking about comparison, uh, we usually uh, try uh, to, especially in, in, in modern narrative, we are trying to talk more about negative things. We are trying to write a positive story. Look, so one thing, like one good couple uh, who are doing their product in a, in a very nice way and a school education can help to, inter, uh, to introduce uh, the whole industry. And uh, as a result, uh, even Siberia uh, was involved in the process because actually uh, they, um, they constructed a, a railroad uh, to Siberia. So you see, that, that is what we are, that, that what we were trying to describe. Uh, because at some point, I don't know why, but um, the Danish roots of most those Danes who were in Russia were forgotten, or partly, I think, because Danes had to learn Russian language. And they like they open uh, their experience, uh, their um, all their baggage of knowledge uh, was um, internal and internalized like Russian. So because of language, because the their names were transcribed in Russian. So it's partly a language uh, that. Partly, uh, partly the main reasons that language we kind of forgot that actually uh, uh, Danish were really important in investing in investing in Russian agriculture. So that will be the focus of our story at some point. And as for inequality, I really love uh, this part of our research, but I think it is slightly early to talk mm -hmm. about it. But we have the comparable uh, data. So that's fascinating that the data that you have in Denmark, uh, I found in, in Russia. So I think that we can write a story about inequality, even on more or less the same sources. So that's am amazing. That's really cool. And I think this, this, the, both this poster, which is a really wonderful aesthetic item and also the story behind it is really fascinating and that brings me to my final question actually one of the things that i thought was was very striking and and very fascinating and very interesting about reading your your project proposal was the the sense that some of these relationships and some of these interactions between russia and denmark between russia and russians and danes have been sort of historically and I guess in the popular literature as well, understudied, maybe overlooked a little bit. And I was wondering if you could just sort of pinpoint, and again, I'm aware of where it's sort of the early days with the project, if there are any sort of particular topics or findings that you, that you hope to draw more attention to. Mm, yeah, uh, I think that both uh, Danish and Russian historians before, uh, we were talking more about international connections. And of course, uh, Princess Dagmar, uh, who became Russian Empress. Uh, so that was the main focus. Uh, what we were trying, uh, I hope, to, to discuss is that um, at some point, uh, this agriculture, it was not only, uh, only about uh, like butter or not only about rubles. Uh, what we are, what we are at, at least at some, um, at least to some extent, what we want to do, we want to include people in the story because it's a very unusual type of comparison when relatively small Denmark and obviously huge Russia, they were interacting with each other and how matters even uh, the impact of one person. Uh, because, for example, in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, in 18, 
1930s, um, Danes opened the first factory of um, the, the first uh, shop and factory where they were selling agricultural instruments uh, and how they were trying to get money from the emperor to open it and how they were paying back. Uh, and uh, also all these things are based on archival material. Um, so in economic history, in all these living standards and numbers and the question of inequality and uh, comparing of GDP, there are people who were living at that moment and how, uh, for example, uh, the so the only my my only concern is that what I'm now talking is more about how Danes helped Russia. So uh, I it may it, I mean uh, it's partly based uh, on on the on the point that uh, really Denmark became like a teacher. Uh, but what is important in terms of economics, history, life, I don't know, universe is that one people's experience, one person's experience matters in mm -hmm. terms of developing a lot of things. Uh, and uh, in, in methodological terms, uh, we are trying to get rid of big narratives and uh, to create the another positive narrative in economics terms and numbers first, like we were doing with these uh, living standards and measuring living standards. So Elena, if you could just sort of close this fantastic and for me incredibly interesting conversation with a few sort of, uh, close this interview with a few closing remarks about sort of the importance of this project and situating it more, more widely, I suppose. Uh, yep, I will try. Uh, so the first thing that I want maybe to repeat or maybe to say again, because uh, I'm not sure that I remember exactly when we stopped, uh, what, we, what we are trying to do, we are trying first to, um, to write the narrative in numbers, uh, what was happening at that moment first. Second, we, are try we, were try we will try to uh, peel these numbers away and to describe people and how people matter in terms of knowledge transfer, first of all, because when we are talking about knowledge transfer, we are talking about at the moment when there were no institutions or Zoom, uh, it was physically who can come and teach people how to do it. Because what is really fascinating, for example, about agriculture, there is a small, just a small remark in Denmark, uh, as, uh, for example, Russians who, visit, uh, who uh, visited Denmark at that moment, they noticed that Danes were pulling up uh, cows' uh, tails. That's why it was easier for Danes to clean everything, and in Russia it didn't happen. So you should physically have someone who will teach you how to pull up these tails and to make your life easier. Uh, all, the third thing that we want to show the impact of one person in one place and when um, to interact, to start, uh, to launch the whole industry. And what is also important, especially now when we are focusing so much on um, problems and uh, somehow it seems for us that to start something new from the scratch is really difficult. It's not, and we have this experience already. For example, um, still now Russian agriculture is not that good, uh, but we have this experience abroad. So we can invite people who can teach us and Russians incredibly in any possible other terms. Uh, so we also can teach. And this teaching person and person, when you're learning language and when you're trying to communicate, uh, at some point, we understand that we are different. So accepting that we are different, but when we are trying to do something better, and in this way, this project is really very positive and uh, in, in this hectic world uh, is even more important that we can do something together. That's a very fitting remark for which to close this interview. It's been a real pleasure to chat to you, Elena, and I'm looking forward to Thank welcoming you. you physically, as you say, to Ulan. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, yeah. thank you. When I learn Danish, <laughs> it will be even easier. <laughs> <laughs>